Welcome to Crisis Management. First of all, let me just introduce myself. My name is Markus Rylan, and today I would like to give you a brief introduction into the key concepts of crisis management. Yet, before I do so, I would like to put the topic into the more contemporary context. Disruption has become the catchword to describe a period of transformative change. Disruption has migrated into the everyday vocabulary of managers, politicians, and of course, of scientists as well. Yet, until the beginning of this year, we did not really envision what kind of disruption was on its way for us and for our society. The corona pandemic is preoccupying public discourse, our global society, and our private life. Such disruption creates ambiguity, and that means that making sense of events, of causal relations, and its consequences is not an easy task at all, but requires the educated mind, scientific skills, and reflective thinking. In this lecture, I would like to introduce different types of crisis, outline key characteristics of a crisis situation, and tap briefly into the research field of crisis research, crisis studies, and crisis management, and then explore the crisis management process, and finally try to make a couple of links between crisis management and strategic management. No, I hope you enjoy the lecture. Before we understand crisis management, it is important that we can distinguish different types of crisis. On this slide, we differentiate between crises that arise within the organization and those that arise outside it. This distinction is critical because the weak signals will be different for each type of crisis. The slide also distinguishes between crises caused by natural or technical causes and those caused by people and organizational breakdowns. So now let's pick up a couple of very prominent examples of crisis situation. The energy company Enron was one of the largest corporations in the US and was awarded six times in a row as America's most innovative company by Fortune magazine. In 2001, Enron caused one of the biggest corporate scandals in US history. The causes were mismanagement, mismanagement operations, accounting fraud and corruption, which led to one of the biggest organizational corruption cases. The second case of illustration happened on April 26 in 1986. And I still remember this quite well because I was a student at the time at the University of Gießen. And there was a day when the largest nuclear reactor catastrophe in history unfolded and it occurred at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant number four. Essentially, there were two causes of this accident. First, human causes because of serious violations by security personnel during a test, and second, technical causes because of specific design characteristics of the graphite-moderated nuclear reactor. Unfortunately, in combination of these two causes, the reactor exploded. Officially, 31 people died, yet estimates put the number of victims much higher, going more up into the several 10,000 but nobody really knows for sure. One of the most serious natural disasters happened in 2004. The earthquake in the Indian Ocean triggered a series of devastating tsunamis along the coast of the Indian Ocean. It affected about 230,000 people, of whom 165,000 were in Indonesia alone, injuring over 110,000 and leaving over 1.7 million coastal residents around the Indian Ocean homeless. The last case of illustration are the 9-11 attacks. On September 11, 2001, terrorists hijacked planes and deliberately flew them into major landmarks in the US, killing thousands of civilians. The 19 hijackers, trained by Al-Qaeda, had been planning and coordinating the attacks for years. The attacks resulted in the death of nearly 3,000 people and over 6,000 others were injured, mostly civilians. 9-11 now marks the anniversary of one of the worst terrorist attacks on American soil in US history. 
in large part Osama bin Laden, the leader of the militant Islamic organization Al-Qaeda, instigated the attacks. 9-11 transformed the first term of the then U.S. president, George W. Bush, and led to what has been since called the global war on terrorism. For the first time in its history, NATO invoked Article 5, allowing its members to respond collectively in self-defense, and on October 7, 2002, the U.S. and Allied military forces launched an attack. The war on terror has been controversial, and despite official ending in 2013, is still ongoing to this day in the form of more targeted efforts. So let's move to some characteristics of crisis. Crises are low-probability, high-impact events that threaten the public security and well-being and is characterized by ambiguity of cause and effect and means of resolution. So one of the characteristics is crises are rare and unusual events. Thus, part of what differentiates a crisis situation from a normal business problem is that problems are usually recurring situations, even when we think about product innovations, so we do routinely innovate on product innovations. Since we lack experience with these problems, there are typically no well-known and well-proven practices to deal with a crisis, so we don't have a well-considered and proven mental model that helps us to make sense of the situation and develop a proper response strategy. Consider the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown. What started as weak signals of a diff difficult nuclear power plant test escalated very quickly into one of the biggest crises in civilian use of nuclear power in human history. Operating personnel experienced a breakdown in making sense of what was going on in the nuclear reactor and took the wrong measures to de-escalate the process. In this case, the unusual magnitude and rare nature and of the event challenged the personnel's ability to manage what would otherwise have been considered as a routine operation. A second characteristic is ambiguity. But what is ambiguity? Ambiguity could be understood or defined as the quality of an event that it is being open to more than one interpretation. So it's not really exact, it's not clear-cut. And under these conditions, different groups of people not only know different things, but also know things differently. That is, each would have a different system of meaning through which its members interpret the crisis issue. Coming back to the corona crisis, for instance, the UK approach differed remarkably from most of the other governments. Instead of closing down the country quickly with mass quarantines and social isolation, the UK tried to manage the epidemic, controlling the infection rate by gradually increasing or relaxing control measures. So obviously, their way of framing what the crisis is and how the crisis can be managed was remarkably different. Another feature of a crisis is urgency. Crises require quick responses because of high time pressures. Think about the 2010 BP oil spill, which certainly represents a free issue that is considered as a crisis. Offshore and deep water oil drilling is central to the streak initiators of most oil, most oil companies. In the BP case of Deepwater Horizon, the oil rig explosion and the subsequent oil leak created a sense of urgency and time pressure for firm leaders to respond. On the operational level of solving the spill issue, engineers faced the problem that the leak occurred in unprecedented depths, in approximately 1,600 meters below sea level. Thousands of liters were released into the ocean every hour, with the ambiguity of how to stop the flow of oil into the Gulf it created urgency to act quickly and find a solution. In the deep water rising case, it took 87 days to stop the flow of oil. In the end, it has been estimated that approximately 4.9 million barrels were spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. Another feature are high stakes. Crisis are high stakes situation and impact the firm's potential long-term health and viability. The crisis itself, or equally an important mismanaging of a crisis situation, has the potential to devastate a firm and exhaust its resources. 
Think about the Enron example. Previously being one of the largest firms in the US became bankrupt and thousands of people lost their jobs and pensions and created mistrust into the practices of accounting firms. Some crises are significant not only for the focal organization, but also for the broader environment in which the organization is embedded. Think about the Snowbrand scandal. Back in 2000, more than 14,000 people got sick from old milk sold by Snowbrand contaminated with bacteria, the worst case of food poisoning in Japan. Finally, crisis is characterized by multiple stakeholders. Crises are significant events precisely because of their potential impact on multiple stakeholders. Stakeholders are an organization's individuals and constituencies that contribute to its wealth creating capacity and activities. They are there for its potential beneficiaries, but also risk bearers. Stakeholders include the area of individuals and groups connected to the focal organization, including consumers, employees, neighboring communities, and even the natural environment. The current corona pandemic is illustrative of the multiple stakeholder situation. It is a rather extreme case because the whole society is affected with an impact on its health and well-being, its economic and cultural and political spheres, including a change in practices. So let's tap briefly into the research field of crisis studies or crisis management. Crisis studies or crisis management is quite a pluralistic research field inspired by different disciplines such as psychology, sociology, organization studies, ecology, political science and economics. Since a crisis has severe impact on its stakeholders, it deals with a big problem. Big problems are by definition systemic or global rather than isolated and local. So we need to address them with a more systemic and not isolated solution. They call for a systemic approach and a multidisciplinary one as well. Let us briefly describe how such a systemic approach may look like. In brief, a systemic approach is multidimensional. So it addresses a problem from a psychological, a cultural and political and economic and a natural science or ecological uh, perspective and dimension. Let's briefly illustrate some of this research. So let's move into social psychology and a cultural dimension. So from a social psychology and cultural dimension, we are interested in sense making of crisis situation, in leadership, in communication, and of course in collective sense making. Especially from a sense making perspective, we consider crisis as a process of a social construction that occurs when people interpret discrepant cues by rationalizing what people are doing. Famous studies are especially from Karl Weick, um, for instance, on the collapse of sense-making in organization, where he investigated uh, with the main gulch disaster how firefighters had difficulties translating specific symptoms of a fire into the proper intervention strategy. A political approach to crisis is emphasizing politics, negotiation, micropolitics and power. One of the early protagonists of a political approach to crisis is Graham Allison. In his work on the Cuban Missile Crisis, he offers an explanation which he calls bureaucratic politics model. A bureaucratic politics model describes crisis management as a process in which state actors seek to achieve separate goals which may conflict with one another. In this case, various individuals representing various organizational interests engage in a process to achieve a negotiated group decision which would represent the policy of the state. So the issue here is power and politics in crisis management and this is well illustrated by his work. But we also find the same practice currently in the coronavirus crisis. Especially autocratic regimes engage in crisis denial, delete information and suppress freedom of speech. In many authoritarian governed countries, emerging or emergency laws which were supposed to protect people from the virus are being misused for repression. Instead of informing the citizen, those in power misuse it. From an economic point of view, consequences in terms of 
production and trade, in terms of growth, in terms of uh, the loss of financial capital, has been part of an investigation. And furthermore, the material ecological dimension has been investigated in, with impacts on land contamination, for instance, or the degradation of air quality or climate change. One of the key messages we can learn from crisis studies is we can only truly understand them from a systemic perspective, because the problem is multidimensional and therefore it has to be treated as a multidimensional problem. Let's consider now the process of crisis management. And here we can subdivide the process of crisis management in different stages. And the first stage can be considered as a pre-stage crisis. In a pre-crisis stage, organizations are usually stable. Uh, in some cases, uh, they may have been extremely successful before. Just in the case of Enron, if we take the case of Kodak, uh, where they have been like industry leaders, or at least they have been not suffering of a severe setback. Another question is uh, in how far they used to prepare themselves in the pre-crisis stage for a potential crisis. Let's have a look at this. Some organizations use the time during the pre-crisis stage to prepare themselves for something that may emerge. So they may invest into prevention. Usually prevention, of course, starts with a specific crisis perception or potential crisis perception. If um, executives or managers do not have the perception that a crisis may occur, they may not invest into proper measures. Typical measures of crisis prevention are, for instance, scenario techniques. Especially in the case of the oil industry, after the setbacks from the 1970s and 1980s, the big oil crisis, they started to engage in scenario techniques and applying scenario techniques. But here the underlying idea of um, using a scenario technique is less to predict the future, or really knowing the future, but rather to understand potential outcomes of potential futures and challenging underlying assumptions. Quite in interestingly, there's a report to the German Bundestag on the risk analysis in civil production from 2012. And if you read through, it's basically the screenplay of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So pretty much what occurred, the event, and how the event uh, unfolded is very well described. In addition, firms may use audits or risk analysis um, that may help to get a clearer picture on how do we prepare ourselves for a potential crisis. Another factor that is very often overlooked is redundancy. So if we have optimized organizations to the highest degree of efficiency, so in the sense that there is no slack, there are no slack resources, there is no redundancy in terms of systems, then these organizations are not very well prepared to act resiliently to specific crises. So redundancy may be a very important measure and some slack resources um, as a prevention measure. Then a triggering event causes the move into the crisis mode. Just think about, on March 24, 1989, the Exxon Valdez oil tanker, owned by Exxon Mobil, ran aground on the reef in the Prince William Sound in Alaska. Afterwards, the spill of 40 million liters uh, of crude oil polluted a unique and largely untouched coastal landscape. So there are specific events that puts the organization into a crisis mode. Whether this is a terrorist attack, whether this is uh, another incidence uh, of severe impact. In how far do organizations have to change their mode of operation once they move into a crisis management mode? As we know from successful empirical cases, they have to change the mode of operation. And perhaps one metaphor that may describe this mode of oper operation is resilience. An organization's resistance to failure is then the ability to manage constructively a crisis. And we may call this resilience. Resilience is a capability that enables organizations to either endure crisis, cha crisis changes without having to permanently adapt, or the organization is forced to adapt a new way of working that better suits the crisis conditions.
When we move into a crisis management mode, it usually means that we can't plan everything in detail, but rather we have to move into an improvisation mode. And that requires that we probably will make mistakes, but we also have to develop a learning regime that helps us to solve these problems very quickly and act quickly upon the problems that we perceive. So learning and being responsive to these changes of an unfolding crisis and improvisation are certainly important hallmarks of a resilient management approach to crisis. Now let's move into the process of crisis management. So once the organization is set into a crisis mode, there are a couple of changes that are taking place. As we know from many studies uh, in organization theory, there's usually a reflex towards the center. So many organizations then have a tendency that strategic decision-making, operational decision-making is more centralized. And that of course has good reasons because organizations have to move very, very quickly and binding key decisions together in a center has been the natural reflex. But we not only want to have a central decision making that may be quick, but we also want to have an informed way of making decisions. And that usually requires uh, a decentralized communication structure that draws on the decentralized uh, knowledge and intelligence of those people in the field. In principle, of course, here we could also imagine a much more less hierarchical or centralized decision making, but a more decentralized decision making. Now, there are a couple of activities that we have to uh, perform during the crisis management process, and I want to describe them more in archetypical firms, uh, forms. So the first one is problem diagnosis, second one is interventions, and the third one are evaluations. So let's start with the first one. Problem diagnosis. As we described before, since the problems uh, of a crisis is not, are not really clear cut, they are highly ambiguous, um, problem diagnosis is very challenging because symptoms are not easily translated into a clear cut problem diagnosis. And therefore, engaging in sense making uh, and in joint sense making is an important task. And as we know from the studies of Karl Weick, um, there are there are collapses of sense making. So in some cases we simply may be wrong. So our diagnosis of the problem may not be the proper one and therefore it may lead to the wrong intervention strategies. But here sense making is not just an individual activity but rather a collective activity because we have to engage in collective sense making and that is important because we also want to create an all organizational response and not just a response from the center or from a CEO. And that requires that we have a joint or social construction of what the problem is. In addition, part of the problem of, uh, of the problem diagnosis is also how do we deal with emotions. Usually crises create anxieties and emotions and negative emotions. Uh, and this is part of the problem that we also have to address because no team will work properly if uh, anxiety over uh, takes the way of how we operate. Based on a problem diagnosis, we have to think about a proper intervention strategies. And these proper intervention strategies will include programs, programs in the sense of we may have to change our products or we have to change our business model. We have to launch uh, specific uh, new processes or technologies that are part of our programs then these programs have to be backed up with resources uh, so that we can put them into action and they have to be enforced by a specific political structure that can actually make these changes, changes happen. And last but not least, the legitimacy of these intervention becomes increasingly an important issue because the more severe these intervention measures are, so the more we restrict, for instance, the freedom of people, just think about the current measures we put into place where we are basically put into currency, where we are restricted in terms of our free mobility, that requires uh, that we can gain legitimacy for these hard measures. Because if we don't have legitimacy for these hard measures, uh, it will certainly un undermine our intervention uh, practices. So legitimacy is an additional issue that has to be 
solved and addressed. And then we move into the third stage um, because we have to continuously evaluate uh, our interventions. Now the problem we face in crisis management is since we haven't really completely understood the problem and many of these interventions we put into place are usually not completely well thought through. Uh, so there are prototypes and we have to evaluate these prototypes and see what impact they have on the organizations, on their stakeholders or on the society as a whole. So that means they are conjectural. And once we put conjectural things into practice, we will occur or we will face many errors. So errors, therefore, is and uh, emerging errors is a natural thing of crisis management. Now, the problem is how do we deal in the crisis management process with occurring errors? We have to encourage people that they spot these errors, that they communicate these errors, because if we don't see them, we can solve and act upon these errors. But at the same time, we should create an awareness that errors and error management is a critical task of crisis management. And we have to use a learning mode from error so that we can address them quickly and try to improve our problem diagnosis and improve our intervention strategies. So these four elements can be considered the core part of a crisis management process. So setting up a decision making and communication structure and then going through problem diagnosis, intervention and evaluation practices. Following this archetypical process model of uh, crisis management, then usually after we are in the severe crisis management mode, we may engage into a post-crisis management mode or post-crisis stage. And there are usually a couple of like uh, additional triggering events that moves us into uh, this post-crisis mode. Now we can imagine different outcomes for the organization. And this is what we would like to discuss now briefly. One potential outcome of a crisis or street response to a crisis is exit or failure. And here we may define organizational failure as an involuntary termination of operations, the insolvency of an organization or the involuntary change in ownership. But sometimes, of course, uh, failure may be much more a deliberate choice in the sense of that we deliberately exit an industry because we don't see a viable business model. There are two dominant reasons in the current literature why organizations fail. One reason is inertia. So they have a tendency of the organization to remain stable, to reproduce specific organizational cultures or routines, and therefore are incapable of adapting themselves quickly enough and responding to crisis uh, requirements. A second one, which sometimes is um, a reason why an organization runs into a crisis in the first place, is what's called extremism. So a tendency of an organization to change too radically or the tendency of an entrepreneur to take high-risk decisions. Organizational failure or the deliberate exit from a specific industry may not be desirable, but it is one strategic response or an emerging response that happens in many cases, from Enron to Snowbrand to many other organizations that have been victims of organizational failure. A second response is retrenchment or downsizing, which is widely observable as a strategic response to a crisis. And here we could say a response is basically a reduction in, in costs, in assets, in products, in product lines, or in overhead. Uh, and such measures usually try to narrow the scope of the firm's business activities. So it's a downscoping and downsizing in its activities. In the short run, retrenchment and downsizing is certainly a necessary response to ensure the viability of the organization. But it doesn't seem to be a good long-term strategy because it usually downscales and downscopes the organization activities. In many cases, it also erodes valuable resources and capabilities in the culture. A third response is preserving. And preserving here relates to specific strategies or interventions that are aimed at sustaining a firm's business activities in response to a crisis. So it's trying to keep the status quo. Thus, 
in contrast to a narrowed scope uh, of activities, as we have learned from the retrenchment strategy, such measures aim at preserving the status quo, like the strategy, the underlying structure, the degree of diversification, and mitigating the adverse impact of the crisis. And as we learned from pure studies, preserving can be surprisingly an effective strategic response to a crisis. Yet, it also assumes that we do have enough slack resources that allows us to go through the crisis uh, through a preserving strategy. And at the same time, and that may be like a downside of preserving, we may not use the crisis as an opportunity to renew our strategy or rethink our strategy and potentially, of course, move into other areas of activities. During the corona crisis, many firms started to diversify their activities by striving on particular competencies. Whether this is 3D printing that are now used for producing healthcare products or using a supply chain competence uh, towards China and therefore importing uh, healthcare products. Finally, renewal, turnaround or innovating. A fourth response to crisis is a turnaround renewal strategy. Here the firm interprets the crisis less as a threat but as a new opportunity space for creating a new strategy a new business model, and translating this into new structures and a new cultural fabric. In a more general sense, firms seek an innovating response. Let's take an example from the photographic equipment industry. Leica camera is one of the oldest and within the professional photographer community most well-known manufacturers of cameras, lenses, binoculars and microscopes. Leica has almost become a victim of digitalization. Back in 2004, the then CEO, Hans-Peter Kohn, gave an interesting interview to the Spiegel, in which he stated, digital technology is only an intermezzo. In 20 years at the latest, we will certainly be photographing with different technologies than today, but film will still exist then. There was an interesting statement reflecting a preserving response. Yet the firm ran into a serious crisis as it generated a record loss of nearly 20 million euro in the financial year 2004 and 2005. So what did Leica do? Two key measures were taken. Firstly, the firm developed highly high quality digital cameras. And secondly, used its competence in optics and lens production to enter a new market for the firm. And that was the smartphone market a key strategic partner became the cooperation with Huawei. In general, turnaround or innovating is a most desirable strategic response, but certainly it's difficult. Yet, given the resource limits of the firm, the opportunity space for conducting strategic renewal may close if managers wait too long and thus use up the firm's slack resources through retrenchment and preserving strategies. This is certainly a lesson we can learn from the Kodak demise. Now let's link strategic management with crisis management. Strategic issues have been differently conceptualized. The more traditional strategic planning literature and practice have dealt with strategic issues in a more contemporary strategic planning process. That does not really help the organization to cope with the big problems they face. They have at least implicitly treated these problems as well structured, as clear cut. As a result, the mode of strategizing was gathering data, breaking down the problem into smaller problems and using many planning techniques for analyzing the environment and prioritizing alternatives. Does this approach help to understand crisis and develop a suitable response strategy? No, I'm sorry. No, it doesn't help, because it does not allow to generate fresh ideas in implementing the solutions necessary. That is because real strategic issues, as well as a crisis situation, have one important thing in common. They are wicked. They are wicked issues. Wicked, wickedness isn't a degree of difficulty. Wicked issues are different because traditional processes can't resolve them. This was pointed out early on by Rittel and uh, Weber, who described them in a 1973 article uh, 
where they dealt with policy making as a wicked problem. So strategy issues are wicked problems. Environmental degradation, terrorism and poverty, these are classical examples of wicked problem. They are the opposite of hard but ordinary problems, which people can solve in a finitive time period by applying standard techniques and trying to well structure and exactify these problems. A crisis is therefore a particular, certainly an extreme, wicked issue an organization might face. The response process requires an innovating and learning approach. One that is responsive to multiple dimensions of the problem, engaging multiple stakeholders, facilitating orchestrating learning on multiple levels and putting interventions to work. There's an interesting study on how strategic planning was changed based on experiencing a severe crisis. Just imagine going back in time. In October 1973, the oil crisis began when the members of the OPEC proclaimed an oil embargo. By the end of the embargo in March 1974, the price of oil had risen nearly 400%, from $3 per barrel to nearly 12 globally. US prices were even significantly higher. The embargo caused an oil crisis or shock, with many short and long-term effects on global politics and the global economy. It was later called the first oil shock, followed by the 1979 oil crisis. I still remember well the driving ban on Sundays. So the question Robert Grant addresses in one of his studies is how did the oil majors like Royal Dutch Shell, Exxon, Mobile, BP or Texaco responded in their strategic planning process to the crisis? So in how far did they change the strategic planning process? Traditionally these firms followed a typical formalized long-term oriented strategic planning process. Yet predicting a future which was highly uncertain or unknown did not really make sense. So he found a couple of interesting things. For instance, the companies changed the foundation of strategic planning. So they downsized forecasting efforts because obviously it doesn't make sense. And they changed from forecasting to assumption surfacing or as we highlighted before, they moved into scenario planning. But here scenario planning is less about trying to know the future, but rather trying to challenge underlying assumptions. And based on these underlying assumptions, trying to develop different strategic responses. There were also changes in the planning systems. So there was a growing informality. So the more formal structure of the planning system was then turned into an autocracy of informality. Then there was a shifting of strategic planning responsibilities back from the staff to line managers in much more decentralizing them to those that were actually close to the action. And there was a change in content of strategic plans. So shortening time horizons when it doesn't make sense to have a 10 or 20 years time horizon when there's high uncertainty about the future. And there was less detailed planning and rather moving towards giving strategic direction and an emphasis towards performance planning. So the study from Grant is quite interesting and still instructive how strategic planning and strategic management is changed and changing based on facing a truly wicked problem. So where learning is emphasized, informality is emphasized and grassroots strategizing seems to play a major role. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and if you're interested what I do elsewhere in terms of lecturing or researching you can just follow my website. And uh, during these difficult times the most important thing is please stay well. Bye bye.